Thank you. Paul and Kate. Thank you very much for the introduction from all of you and for on behalf of both uh, myself and Paul for introducing or for inviting us and having us on such interesting series of webinars. We're very thrilled to be here and share our experiences from Alberta and from across the country actually. So just to start with this slide, um, today we'll be talking mostly about upstream approaches at the school and the policy level. Uh, to address the promotion of healthy weights and preventions of chronic diseases in children. And I will add that Paul and I are co-presenting, so I will start the presentation and then Dr. Googlers um, will continue and then we'll trade back and forth. So uh, hopefully that works for everyone, but we'll be highlighting different portions of the series. So what is the problem? Well, we all know that obesity is a problem, but uh, how do we dissect that or unpack that? And so we all know that lifestyles have changed dramatically, but what exactly does that mean in terms of either our health behaviors or our environment? And so I'll start with the health behaviors because that's very well recognized that um, nutrition, for example, and physical activity behaviors have changed. Uh, we're seeing reductions in physical activity and higher uh, prevalence of sedentary activities and then nutritional um, you know, the diets of children and adults have changed dramatically. However, we also know that individual health behaviors are very much influenced by the environments in which we live. So the context for our health behaviors is very much the environment. And when I say environment, that could be the physical environment or our social and cultural environment. So an example of a physical environment is that now we live in a very much a, a car-centered society and there's fast food outlets um, ever present. So other examples would be are there safe places to play for children? Is there access to healthy food? So if there aren't those um, access to healthy food or physical activity opportunities, then that can influence our personal uh, or individual health behaviors. In terms of our social and cultural environments, uh, there's many different examples as the context for health behaviors. Uh, one would be the difference in income inequalities and consumer access and choice. So all of those different value systems and choosing um, what we're eating or how we're being physically active. And just to mention that in terms of our social environment or cultural environment, children can be considered a vulnerable, vulnerable group um, and can be impacted by these environments. So all of that being said, what do we know about statistics? Well, the Canadian Community Health Survey, uh, the 2004 results, uh, indicated that for adults, 59% are overweight, of which 23% are obese. And for children, 26% uh, are overweight, of which 8% are obese. So this is a, a huge problem. Um, and so next slide will just show us a visual of the problem. So that's kind of the, the textual representation. But this provides a bit of a, a map or a visualization of just how complex this problem is and it's a map that can kind of make your head spin, uh, but it really shows how obesity is really a major public health problem with a true web of complex determinants. So uh, we can recognize this as either an obesogenic environment or some people call it a toxic environment, but it also helps illustrate the interwoven relationship between the individual and the environment in which they live. So looking at this and uh, from discussions of the previous slide, um, is it really simply enough to tell people to eat healthy and be active? And what we're going to try to discuss today is that it's not, that's not enough, that we really need to live in an environment in which uh, the healthy choice is the easy choice. So I'll pass it over to Paul now, who will talk more about the impact of this problem. So you may, uh, you may define obesity as the problem. You could also say obesity is the uh, early marker of the problem, the problem being chronic diseases. And that is a big issue. It affects 98%, 89% of all Canadians sooner or later in life. And it's getting worse. It's now estimated that all children born in this millennium, um, one in three of them will eventually develop type 2 diabetes. The burden is such uh, that it's higher than it used to be, and children are therefore not expected to outlive their parents. So that's a very sad statistic. And it shouldn't be that way because chronic diseases by and large are preventable. 91% of diabetes is preventable by just eating healthy and being active. 
90% of cardiovascular disease or 50% of cancers are preventable by adopting healthy lifestyles. It's a big uh, item, chronic diseases, not only in terms of impact on health, but also in terms of economics. It's a, a big uh, portion of our national healthcare budget uh, goes to the treatment and prevention of, uh, sorry, the treatment of um, chronic diseases. Next slide, please. Here's what uh, some researchers have to say about it. Uh, Dr. Heppel from the um, University of of Calgary um, very nicely phrased it in the editorial that uh, we are expected to live on to be about 80 years old, of which 70 in good health. However, if we were to adapt to healthy lifestyles, we could be uh, 100, of which 95% in good health. Um, so the interesting thing is that we not only get older, but also that the, the number of years uh, with disease are shorter. And so that's what we refer to compression of morbidity. And that comes with an increase of quality of life and reduction in healthcare costs. Speaking of which, Dr. Marzik estimated the economic burden of physical inactivity alone in Canada in 2001 to be $5.3 billion dollars. So those are big numbers. And Dr. Ohidma here at the University of Alberta estimated the Canadian healthcare cost for diabetes to be uh, 4.6 billion in 2000, in the year 2000, and that to increase to over 8 billion in the year 2016. Next slide. Now, if you turn, think in terms of preventing chronic diseases, we tend to think uh, far in the future, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years, and that is correct. Um, however, we should not um, forget about the fact, sorry, I have to log on again, I'm logged out. Uh, we should not uh, forget about the fact, um, a, a recent paper revealed that that there is actually some immediate return of investment as well. As the, um, a recent study showed that healthcare costs for overweight and obese kids are higher than that of normal weight kids. And by the age of 14, uh, this can actually accumulate to $400 um, just solely in terms of physician costs. So it's not big, but it is, it is uh, already adding to the healthcare costs at young age. Next slide. So prevention for a number of reasons, it should be a, a priority um, uh, where it relates to kids. The important thing to, to uh, consider is that um, kids are not only vulnerable, vulnerable, but they're also learn easy. And so if we get them to learn and adopt the early healthy habits, we may hope for a lifelong behavioral patterns that are healthy. Yeah. In addition to that, in addition to that, the benefits to health, there will also be benefits to learning and social development, and later on we will elaborate on that a little bit. And schools is more or less an ideal place. That's, um, that's the place to reach almost all kid, children, and that's the place where children spend most of their waking uh, hours and that's the place for education anyway, so that should also include health education. It's also the place where uh, where we can reach their parents. Next. So you would expect if schools and children is such a logical place to start that there's a uh, uh, big array of uh, literature, and that, that is um, that is not the case. Um, uh, although there is some uh, improvement and there's more papers that are coming out. So we did a quick search uh, recently. We found that uh, we found uh, 32 um, uh, school-based intervention studies and that actually looked at, uh, at affecting uh, body weights. 50% of those studies uh, revealed that school-based prevention studies can be effective. Um, very few of them actually um, looked at um, multiple deeper interventions such as comprehensive school health. And with comprehensive school health, uh, we use the, uh, the George Consortium for School Health definition, which states an internationally recognized framework for supporting improvements in students' educational outcomes while addressing school health in a 
plant integrated and holistic way. Um, one of the examples uh, where a uh, comprehensive school health uh, was evaluated was in the Indianapolis Valley, which is now uh, recognized being a best practice. So the intervention, what they did was uh, constituted of multiple um, sources, and they, for example, provided healthy lunches only. They had a no junk food policy. They um, had daily physical activities. They had free access to the gym, uh, gym for after school. Um, they had a good emphasis on health education, and they also had a comprehensive nutrition curriculum active parent involvement and community involvement. And what we saw, what we reported back in 2005, was the, that these children reported to have substantially better diets. Uh, they were more physically active, spent less time in front of the screens, and were much more likely uh, to, be not, to have normal body weights. So after, you know, that was one example of a best practice. Um, that is actually featured on the Canadian Best Practices portal, but I'll draw your attention to this website where you can actually access other um, best practices. And basically, uh, it provides a really rich description of effective programs and can be seen as a central source for uh, rigorously assessing best practice. So this is the home page, and I'll next... Here's a, uh, another visualization of the website. You can actually search for either interventions or resources, and you can use it to explore things such as school health that can provide a link to either resources or interventions. However, it's not just limited to school health. Um, in addition to the school-based work, there are other about six, 360 evidence-based best practices for health promotion and chronic disease prevention. And it also is a database of resources, so there's manuals and access to other tools that you can utilize. So if you click on either the search for interventions or search for resources, uh, this is an example of a subset of interventions for obesity prevention that are listed on the Canadian Best Practices portal for children ages 6 to 12. And in particular, these listed here uh, utilize both nutrition and physical activity as part of their strategies. Uh, highlighted in red are examples of, of Canadian interventions. So I'd also just like to mention that these are only interventions that are on the Canadian Best Practices portal, and obviously there are many more interventions out there um, that you could also search for, but these are the ones that are highlighted on that portal. And that so after you click on either the resources or interventions, um, you can see these interventions at a glance, and you can do it through either an icon search or a, a key, keyword search. And so in, for this search, the keyword was actually school health, and it highlights nine interventions that are listed within the Canadian Best Practices Portal. And you can see here that there's different icons listing uh, what type of intervention characteristics there are, as well as uh, the evaluation methodology and design. And if you're interested in finding out more about each one of these, you can click on the box on the very right, and, and it will highlight more details about that intervention. So if we were to click on the Annapolis Valley Health Promoting School of Intervention, which uh, Dr. Rugler's just mentioned, um, if you go to the next slide, it will show you what would come up as a summary sheet. And so I'll just briefly highlight uh, this is that it shows that it's an example of a Canadian Best Practices on um, the Canadian Best Practices portal. You can see that there's a link there to the actual intervention site, and it provides a project overview, which Dr. Bugler has already provided, but it uh, indicates that seven elementary schools and one middle school were affected and goes into some of the results. So that's just a highlighting of what's on the Canadian Best Practices portal. Uh, next slide. So now if we take an example of, of an intervention that's on the Canadian Best Practices Portal, which was the Annapolis Valley Health Promoting Schools Program, where do we go from there? And so the question is, can we implement best practice elsewhere? And the reality is that not a lot of people are doing this. And so where we look at best practice, what we want to do is take best practice and implement it somewhere else, so make it transportable. And so that's what we've done uh, here in, in, at the University of Alberta and in Edmonton and Alberta, 
um, with the Apple Schools Project, which stands for the Alberta Project Promoting Healthy or Active Living and Healthy Eating in Schools. And so the, the goal is to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And we're going to be highlighting some of um, what Apple Schools does and, and what it means. But the next slide is actually a link to a video where we're going to provide an overview of comprehensive school health, which is what we're implementing with the Apple Schools project. But this really highlights what comprehensive school health means and what that looks like in practice. As you can imagine, it's quite difficult to evaluate these population health interventions that really are quite complex and they affect multiple environmental levels. And so previously there was a bit of a RCT paradigm, or the randomized control trial paradigm. And so are randomized control trials the only answer or are they in the field of health promotion as uh, mentioned by one group within the World, uh, World Health Organization, inappropriate, misleading, and unnecessary experiences. So uh, there is a need to not just look at an RCT, but evaluate using a variety of methods. So instead of just looking at outcome-based measures, we also need to look at process. Um, so can health promotion interventions work if they're not implemented effectively? And we don't think that they can. And also we need to use multiple methods. So we need to use both quantitative and qualitative methodology. They answer different research questions, so they complement one another to hopefully provide a bigger picture of what's going on within these uh, population health interventions. So within comprehensive school health and within Apple Schools, we look at how to evaluate these population health interventions by looking at three key features. So implementation, impact, and outcomes. And if you think of implementation, uh, this could be described as to what extent is comprehensive school health implemented. And I'll go into detail more on the next slide. In terms of impact, um, has the implementation demonstrated improvements in knowledge and changes in attitudes and behavior? And then in terms of outcomes, um, are students eating more healthy? Are they more active? Do they have healthier weight? So those are some of the questions that you can ask to look at these three key features. Um, there's a visualization of the uh, Joint Consortium for School Health uh, model of comprehensive school health in the four pillars. So when we look at implementation, um, we can actually measure implementation on um, whether advances have been made for each of these four pillars that were mentioned also in the video. So that's teaching and learning, healthy school policy, partnerships and services, as well as the social and physical environment. And so we can look at implementation at all four levels to see how we're progressing. And as mentioned in the video, uh, the HATS tool is, or the health assessment tool for schools is one tool that's used uh, within the Apple School. So that was an example of the interviews with the teachers, and we have interviews with the school health facilitators planned for this month. And the reason why we really want to capture this is they're really central in this project. As well as I mentioned previously, it is the first time that a school health facilitator has been housed within a school full time. And, um, you know, it's a very different dynamic. And so we really want to capture their experiences and their approaches in terms of either role, stakeholder support, the facilitators and barriers as well as looking at some of the comprehensive school health essential elements. So those interviews will be taking place uh, this month and next month. And next slide. In terms of school policies, which was one of the four pillars, this data is from the Real Kids Alberta survey, which stands for Raising Healthy Eating and Active Living Kids in Alberta, and uh, takes place throughout the province. And so this looks at parental support for school policies. And you can see here that parents are actually really supportive of school policies addressing healthy eating and active living until it gets to the point of actually banning uh, food. And so if you think about this, um, that makes sense. However, it was helpful to have these numbers for the school health facilitators to go back to their schools and say, you know, this is important for us to know of how we approach the parents and families when it comes to these field policies. So, we want the policies, policies to serve as a guide and to, to help improve our school uh, environment, but we don't want it to have a negative impact on how the parents feel. So this just provides an example of 
limiting availability of unhealthy foods in schools, uh, ban the serving of these unhealthy foods at schools is still um, viewed as quite positive. Then when you get down to the not allow students to bring unhealthy foods, the percent that agree drops down. However, 39% of parents still believe that you know, they agreed with that statement. And in terms of adhering to the provincial daily physical activity policy, which is in Alberta, uh, requiring students to be physically active for 30 minutes each day, um, that parents overwhel overwhelmingly agree with that statement. So the past few slides have provided an example of you know, the impact and the process evaluation. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Bugler to talk a bit more about the outcome evaluation as well as the impact. So here we see the four uh, pillars of comprehensive school health again. Um, we do have some um, some pockets of evidence that each of the pillars uh, makes uh, makes an impact and uh, with positive outcomes. And I uh, listed a few Canadian examples. Uh, in in uh, BC, Dr. Naylor's group showed that um, you can take away um, hours from uh, from mathematics and language arts and replace that. Uh, with physical education without it actually affecting the school performance. And so that is an important uh, message that, um, um, that schools can look differently at the promotion of healthy eating and active living than, than just that, that serves the purpose of health. Um, Dr. De Taylor's group in the PI showed that uh, in, in some early adopters of a, a healthy school policy resulted in healthier food choices among children. Um, here in Alberta, sorry, um, uh, research um, based uh, in Nova Scotia showed that um, the physical environment in, in terms of access to playgrounds and parks and sports facilities around schools uh, has a positive effect on, uh, on physical activity levels and body weights of children. And, uh, and work by uh, Dr. Leverdale in, in Ontario showed that um, that children attending schools that have uh, strong um, community partnerships uh, were more likely to be uh, physical active. So, so there's some good messages here, but um, it, it's a philosophical point whether uh, you want to analyze and view each of these pillars separately or whether you accept comprehensive school health as a holistic approach uh, which uh, needs to have a holistic analysis. Um, so uh, we are pleased with the outcomes uh, so far. Uh, nevertheless, um, despite our successes, we sometimes are faced with the feedback and here we read one, time spent talking about food and doing physical activity takes away time from learning and kids are in school to learn. Um, this prompted us to investigate the relationship between um, uh, diet quality and later also physical activity and school and school performance. Next slide. And here we, you see some of these results. Um, this comes from Nova Scotia, uh, published in 2008. We um, categorized our uh, 5,000 students in three categories. Uh, those with a, uh, with a low diet quality middle group and uh, a group with high diet quality. We had the opportunity to link our survey information with their um, school performance test, which is centrally administered. Um, so the diet quality was measured in 2005, uh, sorry, when the kids were in grade five, and the uh, school performance was, uh, was from tests that they wrote a year later when in grade six. So what we see here is that relative to uh, children with low diet quality, uh, those children with good diet, uh, the best diet quality were 30% less likely to fail. Uh, so now you may want to make the argument that uh, while kids that have poor that have poor eating habits are also the kids um, that come from poor families or disadvantaged families, and um, there's less emphasis on on learning. Anyways, now we do have those statistical equations that are, take that are all out of the equation. So the relationships we see here are pure um, attributable to diet quality. Now this 
is a quite a complicated slide. I'll guide you through, starting on the right-hand side, uh, what we hope for our children is these three things, good physical health, uh, prosperity, wealth, and good mental health. Um, to be able to measure that, we have to wait till our children grow into adults. We don't uh, want to wait that long, so we use early markers of these three outcomes. For physical, physical health, that is body weight. For wealth, we could look at school performance. And for mental health, uh, most researchers look at self-esteem. These are the three things we measured, and we studied the interrelationships. And this is the red lines reveal the interrelationships between the three. So body weight is affecting self-esteem in a negative way. And, but it's not the other way around. There's no error going up from self-esteem to body weight. Body weight is not affecting school performance, and school performance is not affecting body weight. But school performance affects self-esteem. We know that from earlier literature. But self-esteem is not affecting school performance. Now, there's, uh, that, now we're getting to the left side of the slide, and that's the most important message. We see that diet quality is not only affecting of our body weights, we all know that. And the previous slide had shown that diet quality is affecting school performance. That's also depicted here by the red line. Diet quality is also affecting self-esteem. Yeah? So kids who eat healthier have better self-esteem. Now, physical activity is the same thing. It's not only affecting body weights, it's also positively affecting school performance and positively affecting self-esteem. So in terms of uh, physical health and opportunities in the future, mental health in the future, physical activity and diet quality are really important to promote because it's not only benefiting their physical health in the future, uh, it's also providing them more better learning opportunities and better you know, development opportunities in the future. And it is also very strong associated with better mental health. So there's a lot of things going on in comprehensive school health. Uh, needs a lot of investment. It need, has a number of positive outcomes. And this slide is really meant to sum it all up. Yeah. The, all the gains of comprehensive school health are here listed. Uh, it is, includes um, healthier diets, um, activer lifestyle, better health, better learning, better self-esteem, uh, which we all hope leads to comprehension. Com compression of morbidity, uh, prevention of chronic diseases. It will lead to a healthier workforce important to the economy of the nation, and it will avoid health care costs also important to the economy of the nation. What it needs is um, to promote it, we need more examples of best practice. Uh, to make it effective, uh, we need partnerships. Uh, to, make it, to, to make it start going, we need financial investments, and those financial investments need to be, to need to be made now. Yeah. And we need uh, willingness and we need policies to facilitate this change. So to further support the implementation of Comprehend, uh, we need to consider those financial needs. Um, it's always a difficult uh, selling point to governments, particularly now recession uh, strikes. Uh, um, because the return of investment often comes later. Um, when we invest, we need to consider there's a relationship between dose. Apple Schools is just an example of an intervention that worked with a high dose and had a quick effect. But there's many, many good other programs going on in this province and across the, the country that work with different dose. Uh, the effects of those programs uh, will need a bit more time uh, to be able to show those. Uh, but it is important to know that we're asking for an investment, and it's not a, an, an, a continuing investment. No, it's a, it's not, the idea is it's a one-time investment of implementing comprehensive school, school health, and that then leaves a sustained healthy school communities. And after a while, we withdraw from the schools, and we leave that school in a sustained situation. Really important is that community involvement is there and that support continues. Next slide. 
So uh, you heard this morning Dr. Story and myself speaking, but we really speak on behalf of, an, of a big team, all wonderful people, all have very important contributions to the success of, uh, of our work. Um, and that work would not have been able um, to be uh, done without the important financial support that we receive from a number of listed agencies. They are listed all here. I'd like to underscore the importance of uh, uh, financial resources provided by governments in, here in Alberta, but also in Nova Scotia, and uh, the important contribution of a private donor um, who uh, allowed us to do the Apple Schools intervention, but also the very many um, um, funding agencies, uh, federal and provincial, that help us uh, being successful. Next slide, please. If you want more information, all the um, several presentations and, and also video clips are listed on, on some of these websites. Please check them.